do I have you with me? Can you start the um, the recording, please? Uh, you are live. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so today's lecture is on uh, shifts and discovery. Uh, it's interesting how this is the thing I probably give as a note most often, and I've used I've been talking about it a lot in the first half of class, and will continue to. And that is shifting in the verse and in the prose. The verse often makes it sort of easier to scan. Um, but these are, you know, I talk about how we're constantly battling for our audience's ear. Uh, we talked about operative stresses the first week. We went into sort of more classical scansion stuff the second, but we're trying to keep this interesting for them to follow us. And it's not about, I'm not talking about the terrible performances we've seen, because those are different, but as far as seeing relatively good actors that you can understand here doing bad Shakespeare, um, where you zone out, you get bored. Um, there's no sort of technical deficiency. It's just not working. Um, I think that's on us for often overemphasizing. And that was the point of the first lecture I gave. Um, but really, the, the, the true key is varying uh, tone and pace, shifting on new ideas, inventing new ideas, coining words, um, shifting on phrasing. Uh, we want it, we, we never want our work to get monotonous in this way. Um, the shifts and inventions that we use are what keep the audience engaged. It's what keeps their ear. Um, so you've heard me talk a lot about it um, and it's about discovery. Um, nine times out of 10, maybe more, these characters have not thought these things before they say them. And that seems obvious and maybe most of us would say that, but the difference is that Shakespeare, which to many of us feels a little foreign, a little distant, and when we look at it on the page, we see this sort of structured verse, right? We see what, we see poetry. And I think some of us fall into a bad habit of creating a set speech and reciting. And the difference between invention and recitation is really the core of what I'm talking about here. Rare is recitation valuable in this work. It does happen. Um, you know, there are many kings and others that stand up on a platform to deliver a set speech. But even then, you know, uh, Christian did such beautiful work on Crispin's Day last week. Part of what we were exploring was the fact that Crispin's Day was not planned. You know, he, he finds one of his lieutenants, valuable uh, men speaking ill of their odds, and he realizes he has to do something. So even, even sometimes the things we think of as planned speeches um, uh, rarely turn out to be so. So these are always, you'll hear me harp on like new idea, new idea, new idea. When I'm working in the room with somebody, sometimes, you know, I sort of snap it out. And I think I can find that useful. I'm worried, I'm worried about it on Zoom because there's a small delay uh, and it seems aggressive and I don't want to do it off the right timing. So I, I probably won't use it in our work, but it's this constant effort of creation, creation, creation. Um, uh, while I say that, I'm going to throw a link up because the, the, the speech we're going to look at as sort of an example of this is um, Act 5, Scene 3 of Richard III. I'm going to throw the link up momentarily. This is Richard waking up from his nightmare on before the Battle of Bosworth. So the link's in the chat. It's about, um, let's see, I think two thirds of the way down the page. It's a little, it's a little, pa it's a bit past halfway. It starts with give me another horse, bind up my wounds. Um, and so I'm going to start. I'm going to start using that as examples as we go through this, um, as we talk about discovery. So um, the main the main point being that, as best we can, we want to be discovering these ideas in the moment. And as we discover them in the moment, the audience discovers them in the moment with us. And that's very exciting. And it's much more dramatic than reciting something. You know, we were just looking at uh, Emilia, you know, if, and this relates to questions, which I'll address in a second, but if, if you're discovering it with the audience, they're with you, they're, they're moment to moment with you. Whereas uh, if you're reciting it, if it's pre-planned, if it's already arranged, if you already know what you're doing, and if you ask rhetorical questions instead of real questions, you're ahead of the audience. They're sort of catching up to your point. 
um, which again, there is a place for at times, but for the most part, I think it's less dramatic and, and, and less useful for our work. Um, so again, we're fighting for their ears. When you make discoveries, when you coin a new phrase or when you um, discover the next point of the argument, um, uh, as Cynthia and I were doing uh, in uh, Volumnia earlier, um, uh, there's automatically a shift. When you create, when, when you coin something or discover something, we have a shift. Um, but there are tools that we can use to sort of delineate this more as we go over the text. The major two tools are tone and pace. Tone is, a sh I'm using tone as a very broad term here. Tone is uh, adjusting pitch. You can go up in discovery, you can go down in discovery. Um, it's also pace and phrasing. So often, people talk about this in folio work, often these midline stops where you're working something out, it hits you and then you drive forward with the discovery. And again, these things just keep the audience's ear. When it comes to questions, nine times out of 10, it's better to really ask a question um, and then discover the answer instead of rhetorically asking it to then give the answer. Um, as a small tangent, I, I had the pleasure of working on um, a George Bernard Shaw play at American Players Theater last year and doing the text work with the brilliant Susan Sweeney opened me up to how bad I was at questions. Shaw is even more brutal than Shakespeare because he sort of helps you less. He, he maps it, he also maps his text in a, in a way, but he, he helps you less in terms of, uh, well, in terms of a number of things. But a lot of the work was how many questions the character, you know, I was playing Napoleon, how many questions he asks and how much, how vital it was for me to really ask questions and how hard tonally it was for me to just sort of come up and really ask the questions so that, so it's not easy, um, but it is a part of the work. Um, so I'm gonna take a quick look at something. Let's, let's go to the Richard speech. Um, I wanna look at this tonight because uh, it's early Shakespeare and it's incredibly structured. So when it comes to new ideas, um, I think this will be a, a very good example of looking at this work, right? Um, uh, uh, so let's see. Um, so right about six lines down, we have, what do I fear? Myself, there's none else by. Um, and so uh, I'll go from there. What do I fear? Myself, there's none else by. Richard loves Richard, right? So he, you know, so he runs into it. What do I fear? Myself, there's none else by. And that's tone, I went down. What do I, what do I fear? Myself. There's none else by. That's tone going up. Um, and then what do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. And that's pace and phrasing. And then you could also slow it down. What do I, what do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. I don't know that any of those are quote unquote right. I'm, I'm just trying to give the examples. Um, and then those are also questions, right? What do I fear? Myself? Uh, if you make them rhetorical, what do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. There's less for us to do with it. Um, anyway, so there's some, there's some brief examples. Um, the other thing to talk about in terms of pace are caesuras or pauses. Uh, and this is a, a slightly larger discussion. But to start, you can take a pause to make a discovery. Generally, I think you want to avoid it in Shakespeare. Um, in a review of Johnston Forbes Robertson's Hamlet, Shaw wrote famously uh, that he was playing it as Shakespeare should be played on the line and to the line with the uttering and acting simultaneous, inseparable and in fact identical. Um, on the line and to the line it is what has sort of famously been passed down. The idea being that you're not acting between the lines, you're not pausing for it. Acting uh, and uh, delivery are one and the same in, in this work. Um, now, on a side note, there are people that say there is no subtext in Shakespeare. I don't think that's true. That's a separate discussion. Um, but for this, I think, I think pauses are absolutely allowed. You just gotta choose them. Don't, you know, and often when you look at taking a pause to make a shift, an interesting thing in the work is then to stop and go, can I do that? without the pause. 
Um, and if you can, it's often more exciting. Shaw also said uh, that the only pauses in Shakespeare should be for sword fights and, and processions. Again, he's talking in an extreme way, but it's good advice to think about, even, even if I don't always agree with him. Um, there's a wonderful collection of uh, essays called, just called Shaw on Shakespeare, where it's his, all of Shaw's reviews of Shakespeare uh, put together. It can be infuriating at times, uh, and Shaw was very jealous of Shakespeare, but there is some really beautiful stuff in there. Uh, and Shaw was himself a genius and had a lot of incredible things to say. So maybe something you might enjoy if you feel like checking it out. Um, so pauses in Shakespeare. So can you do it without the pause? So here's the main point. Uh, Shakespeare asks us to think faster than we do. This is an athletic event. Um, uh, we often, I don't know if in modern speech, we actually take as many pauses as we seem to want to take as actors. Um, but Shakespeare's asking us to think faster than that. He's asking us not to slow down the work, uh, to act. Um, so if you can avoid the pauses, please do. Um, so shifting in discovery. So how do we know where to add these shifts and to find these discoveries? The first answer is analytical. It's just analyzing the text. When something new is discovered, shifting so we can discover it in an interesting vocal way is helpful. But the other is interpretive, which is um, what discoveries make for the most interesting story. Now, I started this lecture talking about how nine times out of 10, none of this is planned. So you could argue with me, it's all discovery. And the, respo the, you know, the response to that is you got to find your hitch points. What words or phrases, what places make, do the discovery occur that lead to a cascade of further thoughts? Um, uh, because you don't want to overemphasize. You don't want to discover each word as you say it. It stops being interesting very, very quickly. But if you discover the word, the rest can come out. Um, and so we were looking at some cascading stuff in the Amelia speech just a little bit earlier, right? So, um, so you find, so you don't want to discover every word, but you want to find your hitch points, your words or phrases where the discovery transpires and by which the argument continues. Um, you know, I, uh, near the end of to be or not to be, you know, Hamlet goes, and who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death right? And that cues the next thing, which he coins, the undiscovered country from whose bore no traveler returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. Next discovery. And thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Next discovery. So the and thus, and thus, is a building of discovery, and thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment in this regard, their currents turn awry. So you can see that there are hitch words and hitch phrases where I am making these discoveries and they're building and cascading as they go. I am not discovering on every word. Um, and a lot of what I just did is interpretive. You could choose other words, you could choose other phrases, um, but it's an example. Um, so another small thing to mention is if, if in, in an interpretive way you're looking at it and you go, well, you know, you could discover this here or later. If you're having a debate, later is often better. You know, it's a great moment from the playing Shakespeare series that I have recommended a few times now where they, in, the, in the, the dueling Shylock's episode where they talk about when does Shylock actually decide that he's gonna kill him, that he's gonna take his pound of flesh. And there's many moments you could argue for in that scene, but what Barton and Patrick Stewart and David Suchet discuss very nicely is that, well, the later the decision happens, the more dramatic, right? The, late, the longer we extend the suspense, the better. Um, so now an audience knows the play, they might, they might get ahead of you, but if you're, if you're 
if you're playing it forward in that way, if you withhold the decision as long as possible, you know, Shakespeare breaks the rules, the rules of comedy all the time. He does it in As You Like It. When does Orlando know it's Rosalind? You know, if he never knows until the end, he's sort of a moron. But if he knows in the beginning, uh, then there's really no play. Then this is all a joke. Um, and so, Shakespeare doesn't give us that answer. You know, he doesn't tell us what happens to a poor Antonio who loves the shit out of Sebastian at the end of the 12th. You know, I mean, these are, he doesn't answer all our questions, um, which is interesting. So you have to make these interpretive choices. Now, poor Antonio, there's no choice. That's a different thing. But, um, but, but, but you get to make these choices, which is part of the excitement of the work. Um, and so, and then there's a structure of discovery, which I just went through with the and thus and thus in Hamlet. Each discovery doesn't necessarily need to be a totally separate thought. Sometimes they are, but um, quite often it's a quite often it's a build and a development. One thing leads to the next, leads to the next. Um, so, do we have any guides? Yes, um, punctuation is a good guide. Full stops which are generally periods, semicolons, and question marks. And question marks people will debate about. They don't always necessarily need to be quote unquote full stops, but um, they're a good hint that a shift is going to transpire. Um, when, a when you see a period or a semicolon, there is probably a shift, either a new idea or a development of an idea. If you find yourself running over a full stop, in the same way, if your tonal argument is the same before it and after it, you're probably not varying the work enough. Um, this, de this demands a lot of us, right? So um, a quick note, who wrote those fucking, you know, who wrote the punctuation? M many editors have gone to this punctuation a lot. We can't even necessarily fully trust the punctuation of the folio, although there are folio believers that really do. And that's, and there is, there is, good stuff to mine in there, but that's interpretive too. It's partly your responsibility to look at this work and make decisions about it. Um, but again, periods and semicolons often are your places. Um, and then there's coining. And what I mean by coining is choosing your word or choosing your phrase. It's plucking it out. And in a way it's the, it's the same realm as discovery, but it's actually the opposite of discovery in a sense. It's sort of, so a discovery is when you finally come upon the exact right word, whereas coining is choosing it. So, um, uh, 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 slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, right? Slings and arrows. Um, uh, one, a Hamlet could pick that out. Um, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And you sort of frame it, you lift it, you're choosing your word. Um, now I'm gonna look at the Richard speech. There's really not any place to coin in there, but I'll find one as an example as we go through it. So I'm timing myself for these two. I wanna, I wanna keep it tight and we're doing, we're, we're not doing too bad right now. Um, so I'm going to, I'm gonna read over the Richard speech and I'm gonna to try to emphasize what I'm talking about a little right now. So I'm gonna turn, turn it up a little bit on the shifts. This might be a bit more than you might wanna do in um, performance, but hopefully it will, it will help clarify what I'm talking about. And again, I'm looking at this, it's early Shakespeare, it's very structured verse, and the new ideas, the discoveries in this speech don't stop coming. So I'm gonna to try to use tone and pace. I might use a pause or two, I'm gonna to try to draw phrases out. I'm gonna to try to tighten phrases up. Um, I'm going to try to really ask questions. I'm just looking for variation and sort of aha moments. Now, I've never, I've never played Richard, um, although I very much hope to one day. Um, but I, you know, I looked over this a little in preparation. This is a bit of a cold read, but I'm, I'm gonna turn up, I'm gonna to try to turn it up on the discoveries. So in the beginning of this, he's having a nightmare on uh, Bosworth's field and all the, many of the ghosts of those he, have, he has murdered have come upon him. And so he's in the midst of a nightmare. Give me another horse, bind up my wounds, have mercy, chase you. Soft, I did but dream. Oh coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? 
the lights burn blue. It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? <sighs> no. Yes, I am. Then fly. What? From myself. Great reason why. Lest I revenge. What? Myself upon myself? <laughs> Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh no. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie. I am not. Fool of thyself, speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree. Murder, stern murder in the direst degree. Good, and I'll stop there. So I'm, I'm trying to bring out the shifts, etc. Um, I, I hope you could hear it. For a coined word, Again, there's not, I don't know if there's many good ones in this. You could argue conscience could be coined in the sense that it's interesting that Richard has never had one and he's discovering one perhaps. So you could go, fool of thyself, speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues. So he's discovering it. You could also take a pause. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues. And he's, he's plucking it out of the unknown. So... Anyway, th some possibilities. Um, so in conclusion, shifts and discoveries, new ideas, coining phrases, varying by pace and tone to keep your discoveries in the character interesting, exciting, varied, different, so that the audience's ear hopefully never zones out and you don't lose them. Um, it's the note I will probably give most often. New idea, new idea, new idea. Uh, can, you, uh, can you tonally shape that differently for me? Can you discover it in a different way? Can you really ask that question? Um, that's really the, that's the core of it. Um, uh, are there any uh, follow-up questions to all that? Uh, if you would like to ask them, please, in the participants menu, you'll see an option to raise your hand. Please, please go ahead and do that if you'd like. Give anybody a second. All right, pretty clear.